Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. Now, after I did my talk on the 2010 Greatest Living Conductors, some of you started ribbing me and you were saying, well, why don't you do it for the 10 greatest living composers? And I did a little talk on why it's impossible to pick the 10 greatest living composers and why we shouldn't even bother trying because it's a total waste of time. That generated a little bit of furor back and forth. And then some more of you said, well, why don't you just tell us who, you know, some of the living composers are that you like? And I said, well, you know, I'll think about it. And I thought about it. I thought about it for five minutes and I came up with 16 of them. And that's the truth. I said to myself, all right, let's see who just pops up off the top of my head without me having to make much effort. Because you think that, ooh, to find a living composer, you have to dig around and scrounge. And no, you don't. They're right there in plain sight. There's plenty of recordings. Tons of stuff to listen to, boatloads of things, and I just pulled out 16 right off the top of my head, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Are they the best? I have no idea. I don't care. And beyond that, my theory about contemporary music, as with all music, is that because it's all just entertainment, I have no obligation to listen to living composers. I couldn't care less about who they are, and it is their job to please me. Ooh, see, drop one. That's what they're supposed to do. They are supposed to please me, the listener, and you, the listener. In other words, they are supposed to please us. And if they please us, that is all the qualification they need to do anything that they want to do. And I will follow them and listen to them. And it may be that some of those will turn out to be the next Beethoven. You know, some of you had these really silly criteria for what constitutes greatness and how we can tell and what that is. And some of these people meet those criteria, I have to tell you. But, but that's not even the point. It's just not the point. The only thing that matters is whether we like them. And that was a very smart comment, I thought, that one of you said, you just tell us which ones you like, and that I can do, and that I will do. I do get a little bit um, defensive when people say, well, you should talk more about contemporary music, because people who say that only say it because they haven't seen what I've been talking about. They're just ignorant. I spent a lot of time talking about contemporary music. I spent a lot of time talking about 20th century music, and I have two observations about contemporary music. Number one, um, this idea of living composers. Who gives a damn if they're alive or not? What about the recently dead? I mean, George Crumb just passed away. My disc of the year was Nikolai Kapustin, who a lot of you had never heard of and who just passed away. I, you know, if, they're, if they've only been gone for a decade or two or less, then, you know, don't they count? Aren't they modern enough? I mean, what kind of foolishness is that? And beyond that, beyond that, we have a very very silly concept of periodicity in our discussion of music because, you know, it's, it's almost like people with a pop music mentality. You know, I see these things and I say, oh, the music of the 70s and the music of the 80s and the music of the 90s. How about the music of the, of the modern period starting in 1600? I mean, you, you think of things historically, you have to think in much larger spans of time. What's the difference between somebody who died in the 1940s and somebody who died in 2015? I mean, the difference is what, 70 some odd years, but it's not a difference. It's virtually no difference in, the, in, in historical time. I'm not talking geological time. I mean, just the, the normal, normal historical time, things don't change that much. There's no, there's no reason why something that happened yesterday is better than something that happened 50 years ago. Or because something good happened 50 years ago and it didn't happen yesterday, that there is no great music being written and everything's going down the crapper and it's all terrible and we'll never have the next Beethoven. It's all foolishness. Silliness, people. Stop it. Stop worrying about it. I'm telling you now, you're just, you're just getting yourself worked up over nothing. Your only job is to find the music that you enjoy listening to.
And I, like I said, am more than happy to discuss that. So here is my list of 16. Let me get it here. I have it here. I actually wrote it down because I knew that if I didn't write it down, there would be no way in a million years that I would remember what it was. So wait a minute. Here we are. Okay, there it is. There are the big, the lucky 16, more or less. And I have some like show and tell objects here. So not for all of them, you know, I don't think that's necessary. And I'm not playing any samples. You're going to have to go and listen because it was your challenge. And I'll give you the names and you go do your homework. They're all available, all downloadable. It's all there. You can find them without any problem. I'll write their names below this little thingy so that you can get a chance to listen to it. Now, um, these are in no particular order, so I have to like find my my visual visual aids. Oh, here is visual aid number one. Okay, so number one is Paul Lansky. Who you might say? Well, Paul Lansky. Paul Lansky was one of the few composers who wrote electronic music that was really fun to listen to. I mean, he's really, he's really a wonderful composer. This is not electronic music, though. This is Shapeshifters, his concerto for two pianos and orchestra. This is all on Bridge. Bridge Records has done a great deal of recording of Paul Lansky's work. And so you can find it there, and I recommend it very, very, very highly. Um, and then With the Grain, a concerto for guitar with the inimitable David Starobin playing the guitar, and then Imaginary Islands for orchestra. This is all with the Alabama Symphony under Justin Brown. Lansky's music is really fun. He's, he's a creative, interesting character with a genuine original voice. A lot of it's sort of nicely tonal. Some of it goes a little kooky. It's just great stuff. So this is on bridge. Paul Lansky. He's number one. Number two. Let me find number two here. Oh, here she is. Okay, Lyra Auerbach. Now, Lyra Auerbach is Russian, and and she's comes from the sort of Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Schnitka school um, of com composition. And I know her mostly from her chamber music. She's also a superb pianist, especially in her own music. And this disc on CD. Um, is called Cello Qui, because it's music for cello and piano. And you get her 24 preludes for cello and piano, which is a 50 minute long extravaganza. And it's 24 preludes, get it? It does the, you know, major, minor key thing, and all the major, minor and keys. And it's, oh, it's marvelous. First rate, absolutely first rate, mostly very brief little pieces, but delightful. And then his, her cello sonata is on here and the postlude for cello and piano. Now they feature Auerbach herself at the piano and, and Ani Aznavourian cello, superb disc, unbelievably well recorded because Sidi, the label here, does great, great work in terms of sonics. And um, if you want to hear some beautiful, beautiful, creative, inventive chamber music with one foot in tradition and its other foot wherever we are now, then the Lara Auerbach is someone to explore. And quite a bit of her chamber music has been recorded, sometimes multiple times, because it's really, really fine and uh, immediately enjoyable. So there you go, Lara Auerbach, number two. Number three is Jennifer Higdon who some of you already mentioned. Jennifer Higdon has become much more than just sort of the American female flavor of the month composer. She's a really good composer. She's written big orchestral works. They've been recorded. Um, she is a composer whose style um, I haven't quite put my finger on yet, but she wrote a harp concerto. Yay, she wrote a harp concerto. I mean, you got to love people who write harp concertos. She has um, a, a, I would say, I would say, well, what would I say? I mean, she's colorful and she has a wide range of expressive, expressive, you know, feeling in her music. And the nice thing about her, I mean, her music is mostly tonal. And the thing about her is that, is that she's, she is pleasant enough and enjoyable enough that people are willing to take a risk in recording her major orchestral works which, you know, it's expensive to do that, and they do it. 
So you can find some major things by her out there. Telarc recorded some stuff she wrote. She wrote things for Atlanta. She's been, she's gotten major commissions all over the place. And I think that she's a voice to pay attention to. But, you know, there are really quite a few like that. I hope, I hope that she persists. Another one, I mean, and she's not on my list, but I don't care. We'll mention her anyway. It was Joan Tower. Remember her? She did a piece called Sequoia, which is just marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. Leonard Slackett recorded it, as he does a lot of contemporary American music. And then she kind of disappeared. Now she's kind of making a comeback, which I think is great. I'm really happy because she's a very, very good composer. And, you know, and that's what happens with these people. The problem is um, with our modern times is that, is that it, it used to be, maybe not so much now, but it used to be that when you know, these, these composers sort of burst on the scene, they would make a recording of one work or they'd win a Pulitzer Prize or something would happen and you'd listen to it and everyone would go, oh, that's nice, and they disappear because there was no sustained interest. So you couldn't follow them. And that adds to our impression that there is no great composer out there because they come and they go and they're here and they're there and they're gone, and, but they're there, they're there, they're writing music. Most of them have amassed a considerable body of work once they've hit their 40s and 50s or so. And so, you know, there's no reason why we can't enjoy them. And because of, thank God, YouTube, digital downloads, all of these streaming services and orchestras self-producing their own stuff and whatnot, there's a much, much better chance that going forward, we'll be able to follow the careers of these people with a certain amount of consistency. See, this is the one thing that pop music had that, that classical music never did. Pop music, they have artists, they have their own labels, or they work for certain labels, and making a record is not such an expensive proposition, or someone just records a live concert, and there you are. But with classical music, because of all the different media and the logistics and, and, and the, the desperate dearth of funds um, in the recording industry, it's difficult. It's difficult to stay in front, in front of the game especially since you're supposed to have a very, a very lengthy creative life, unless something awful happens. You know, pop musicians, they get together, they make a few albums, and then they all, you know, break up or, you know, kill each other or whatever they do, and then it's over. And then you're into the 80s, next decade, they were the past. They only did things two years ago. It's already old news. That's so weird. I mean, there's no concept of staying power at all. But classical musicians are supposed to have staying power, at least the good ones, but we don't give them, we don't give them the resources to stay. So, so hopefully that will change now with you know, the, the way that the industry and the way we consume music is changing. So Jennifer Higdon is someone to definitely watch out, watch out for. Now, another one, wonderful composer. Oh my goodness, he's terrific. And I've been following him for like... A bazillion years. Oh, here it is. Magnus Lindbergh. Now, Magnus Lindbergh burst upon the scene with a piece called Kraft. Force, you know, strength in Deutsch. And, and this, that, this came out, well, right at the time that I was just starting my career as a critic in the early 80s, around 84, 83, 84, something like that. And he won, back in those days, it was the International Record Critics Award, an Urca Award for craft and contemporary music. And that was a big, crazy, noisy, texture, you know, in your face, you, you know, blow up the universe kind of piece. Since then, he's grown up. His music has moderated itself somewhat in tone. He now writes, you know, melodically sometimes. Oh my goodness. But he's just a gifted, gifted artist. And this disc that I'm holding here, a lot of his stuff is on Ondine, and there's a box of his orchestral works, and you should hear them. Um, his, he's got a piece in here that I just love. It's called Graffiti. It's a setting of actual Roman Latin graffiti from like the walls of Pompeii. And it is so brilliantly done. And it's got like some pornographic graffiti and other graffiti. It's really cool. It's a lot like, it's a lot like, you know, um, um, what's his name? Uh, Harry Parch's hobo songs, you know, Barstow, you know, where he just took hobo inscriptions and set them and they're wonderful. Well, this is kind of, kind of the, the logical expansion of Harry Parch's original concept. And it's great. And you also get Zeit die Zone for orchestra, which is 25 minutes of wonderfulness. 
I mean, Lindbergh is just a good, 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 talented, gifted, fabulous composer, and you should listen to Lindbergh. So that's number four. Number five. Yes, you're not going to believe it. Arvo Part. Arvo Part is not dead. He just writes like he is. Just kidding. Um, you know, uh, there are so many composers who did this sort of spiritual... You know what I mean. <laughs> you know, we did a thing about John Tavener being the worst composer that ever lived, or one of them, you know, who did similar stuff. But part, part, he's a real, he's the real deal. I mean, I don't like everything he did. Some of it, I think, is a little self-indulgent. And I do think the spiritual angle can be, you know, more important than musical substance. You know, that is, the longer it is and the less musical material you use and the more it approaches, it approaches monophony, like chant, um, you know, the more spiritual it must be and the more people are supposed to listen to it and go, oh, my goodness, that's so spiritual. Well, maybe it is. I just think it's boring. But he also had a lot of really good music. And I think his shorter works or reasonable length works are, are his strongest, frankly, because they are the ones in which he seemed to have, you know, poured the most music into them, into the mold here. This is, this is Arbos. This is a, an ECM recording, which you can tell because it's white and featureless. Um, and uh, it, it's just good music. It's good, solid, interesting music of, of the nature that he is. Remember, he began as an avant-garde guy, a 12-tone guy, and then gradually um, let it go and became his, his current unbelievably meaningful self. But he is a major voice, a major voice in, in 20th century music, and he is a major voice who's had a great deal of influence, and fortunately, he's still the best one rather than those who have been influenced, at least so far that I can tell. Maybe there's one I haven't heard. So, Arvo Part, give the man credit. So let's see, Arvo Part. After Arvo Part, we have, oh my goodness, another guy who's on Ondine and a lot of other labels. I love this guy, Leo Brower. Cuban composer Leo Brower. He is amazing, B-R-O-U-W-E-R. -E Don't worry, I'm putting everyone's names down here. Brower is the greatest composer for the guitar in like the history of guitarism. He's just fabulous. I mean, there are pieces, his, his various etudes and the Black Decameron, and I mean, he just writes great, great guitar music that doesn't sound thin and, and musically empty, and, it, and it's not just your usual, your usual Spanish dancelet. And, oh, it's just good, solid music, and it happens to be written for guitar. He's marvelous. This is like one of my favorite records ever. I've talked about this. I did a separate video about Brower. Those of you who say I don't talk about contemporary music. Um, and Brower was born, well, let's see, 1939. Oh, my goodness. He's mom's age. Anyway, this is his guitar concerto number five, Helsinki, along with some a bit of the Albania's Iberia suite um, for guitar, arranged for guitar and orchestra, three movements, and the best, the best from yesterday to Penny Lane. It's one, two, three, four, five, seven Beatles transcriptions arrangements. They're not just transcriptions. They are reimaginings for guitar and strings. And oh, gosh, they're wonderful. Brower is a fantastic composer. So he's one, two, three, four, five, six. We're already up to number six. Number seven. Number seven is Esapekka Salonen, who, as you already know, is an absolutely first-rate conductor. Some of you said he's the greatest Stravinsky conductor alive. You're probably right. He's done amazing things on records. He's now in San Francisco. He took time off to compose. And, you know, a lot of conductors take time off to compose, and we don't know why, because they just suck. One of them, one of the most famous ones, was Lauren Mazel. Yes, he composed, believe it or not. He wrote a violin concerto, I think. And, you know, he was talking about taking a hiatus after he was conducting Bavarian Radio, taking a hiatus to fulfill, you know, the many demands people were making for new works that he would compose. And everyone was like, hmm, I don't remember anybody asking him to write anything. I don't think anybody did, but he did. And now, where are those works? Gone! Gone forever! But amongst today's conductor-composers, Salonen is one of the strongest. Um, his works have funky titles like, you know, Nick's Blopula and, and Hoogee Widget and, and 
you know, you know, Confractus 9 and I don't know whatever else he calls them. I don't care. They sound good and they're interesting. And uh, again, he's got a voice. And, you know, one of the things about about Finland is that it has made such a an emphasis on promoting its musical culture, you know, all because of Sibelius. He knew not what he did. But he did. So there are amazing composers, 20th century composers, and we've talked about some. We've talked about Rotovara. We've talked about England. You know, we've talked about, you know, Matatoya. We've talked about a whole bunch of them. And there are, and they're, and they're wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. And we just talked about Magnus Lindbergh, and, and we're going to talk about more. And Saladin is great. And, of course, they're churning out conductors like they're going out of style. I mean, that's... That's what happens when you have a little country with a really, really, really world famous composer. And Esapekka Saladin is one of the most gifted of what you might call the Finnish eruption or whatever you want to call it. But uh, he's terrific. So his stuff is worth listening to. Very, very, very rewarding. And, and, and uh, he also writes some big, big pieces, orchestral pieces that are fun to listen to. Uh, next. Oh, oh, yeah, baby, William Balcom. William Balcom, thank God he's still alive, 1938, he was born, he's still around. Don't tell me he's too old, he's not dead. And he's incredibly imaginative. And this is, this is his Songs of Innocence and Experience. You can read the review at classicstoday.com. Jed Disler reviewed it for us. It is a huge three-disc, yeah, masterpiece, endless song cycle in every possible style you've ever heard. Bolcom is an eclectic. He's part of that school. That's the school of American eclecticism, of whom there were many. A lot of them, uh, you know, sort of were originally marching in the style of Mahler because he was a major eclectic. But, you know, afterwards they realized we already had one, and that, of course, was Ives. And Bolcom is, is very much in that tradition. He writes in everything from post-Webernian serialism to jazz and pop, and, and, and he mixes it all together. And, oh, gosh, it's wonderful. He's also written a whole pile of symphonies, which are just terrific, and a great violin concerto. Oh, it's on Argo, if you heard it. So William Bolcom is someone you should be paying attention to. You really, really should. There he is. So after William Balcom, we have, oh, let's see what else we have here. Oh, yes. Gabriella Lena Franck. Now, this was a major discovery for me. She did three Latin American dances. They were recorded on reference recordings, along with the Bernstein Symphonic Dances from West Side Story and Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances. It was a fun record, if you can go find it. This is some of her chamber music. You've got Ilos Threads. And the Danza de los Saxampios for two marimbas, and the Adagio para Amantani for cello and piano, and then finally Quixotadas for string quartet, which is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Franck is, is another one of those composers who you listen to, and, and you know that she, you know, she was born in Berkeley, by the way, California, and she's Peruvian slash Chinese. Uh, her mother and her dad was Lithuanian and Jewish. Now there's a combination for you, huh? And yeah, she does have part of that Latin American style. And I love Latin American composers. I have to tell you, I just like that whole part of the world. I think that it's popular music is fabulous because it has rhythm. It's vital and vibrant and young and fresh. And the classical mm -mm, composers who are you know, paying attention to what's around them um, in the way that, for example, Revueltas did and other composers of that type have really, really created a wonderful bottle, body of work, bottle, body of work. And Franck is one of those. She is a real New World composer with real talent. And this is on Naxos, so you can get this easily. See, there it is. Gabriella Lina Franck. Listen to her stuff. You're going to really, really enjoy it. She's, she's, I look forward to everything that she does. I think she's a real talent. I really do. And she's written a lot more music. And, you know, it, it, hopefully it will, it will appear in, in greater quantity as time goes on. So she's terrific. And then let's see. After Gabriella Lita Frank, who do we have? Ah, 
Steve Reich. Remember him? He recently wrote his first big orchestral work in 30 years. I guess he wrote it around 2018 for the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He's still composing, guys. He's out there. And I have him, and I'm putting him together with Philip Glass. I know you're going to go, oh, God, not Philip Glass. No, not Philip Glass. Philip Glass is a genius. Philip Glass, you know, one of you said that the definition of a composer is one who has had major influence on the direction of music, you know, after him. Well, Reich and Glass have done that. The minimalists generally did that. They changed the direction of contemporary classical music, not just in the U.S., but in the world. It took the world a little while to catch up. They started in the U.S. But the fact of the matter is that minimalism, some of which I like, some of which I don't, is, is a major, major trend. And it was a major trend that, that gave music back to everybody. It may not have been the most thrilling thing in the world. Some people hate it, but it's very listenable. It's mostly tonal so far. I mean, you know, there's, there have been developments since that have made it more harmonically interesting, particularly in the hands of people like John Adams, who's not on my list, but he is a major, 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 major composer. I just thought it would be too easy to put him on my list. You know what I mean? I didn't want to, I didn't want to feel like, I didn't want you to feel I was slumming. So I left John Adams off, but, but he's great also. And the minimalist school is a school you might call it a common practice even. Ah! Yes, a real school like the Viennese school. And, and they have absolutely had as much impact on contemporary music as any, any prior composer and probably more than most. They really have, because you say, oh, well, you know, the influence of Beethoven. The influence of Beethoven was the influence on like, you know, five people in Europe who we care about today. There are a lot of people who weren't influenced by Beethoven, a lot more who were not than who were. And the same is true of Wagner, by the way, who everyone was supposed to be influenced by, everybody who could not be. Oh, everybody said, Wagner, Wagner, Wagner. Gah. There were plenty of people who were not influenced by Wagner, including his own son, <laughs> Siegfried, who couldn't sound like, less like his dad if he if you wanted to. So anyway, my point is that the minimalists are major people and they've written wonderful, wonderful works. I mean, Glass just finished like, like, I don't know, he's written 15 symphonies or something like that. And piles of concertos and instrumental works, lots of music. And his operas, his theatrical works are groundbreaking. Again, you may not like them. Who cares whether you like them? They are wonderful. I love them. I think they're fabulous. And more to the point, more to the point, his style has been epically influential. So don't tell me. I mean, if there's any definition of greatness in a living composer, these guys have it. And Reich, Reich, I mean, music for 18 musicians, which is a masterpiece. I mean, the desert music, these are, these are glorious pieces of music. And they are so innovative and original and different from anything that came before, but they're using, they use simple elements of music, simple chords, tonality, in completely new and fresh ways. Doing things no one had ever done before. I mean, if that isn't the definition of greatness, then what is? Seriously. So I, I, I have no patience for people who, who dismiss Glass and Reich and, and, and that crowd just because um, they don't like minimalism. Well, go, don't like it, but don't dismiss it because you would be a fool to do so. So Glass and Reich are two. Um, let's see, so I have Glass and Reich, and who's next? Oh, yeah, another Finn, Aulis Salonen. I love Aulis Salonen. Now, I played some of his music too, and he was one of my mystery pieces, which a bunch of you guessed immediately. I played Shadows, his orchestral work. I love his orchestral work. Now, Salonen has written seven operas, eight symphonies, tons of shorter orchestral pieces, wonderful chamber music, string quartets, and music for string orchestra. Salonen is a tremendous composer. He may have written himself out a little. I mean, his last major work, I think, was written in 2018. Um, he was born in 1935, so he's getting up there. He's really getting up there. But he's left a very considerable body of work, his seventh symphony, 
is just marvelous. It's called Gandalf Dances or something like that. He's written a great cello concerto and a violin concerto. And, oh, they're all here. But I like yeah, someone who'll write a symphony based on Lord of the Rings. That's really fun. His seventh. It's on, all on CPO. It's this nice box of Saladin on CPO. It's one, two, three, four, five. You get all the symphonies. And you get, uh, yeah, the cello concerto and other short orchestra, violin concerto, horn concerto, and other short orchestral works. So, I mean, what is not to love? He's well represented and well worth hearing. So there. And I think he's the last of the Finns in this pile. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes. I said I wasn't going to talk about John Adams. Well, I kind of lied because I'm talking about a different one. John Luther Adams. Now, John Luther Adams, when he was living in Alaska, was Alaska's greatest composer. Now I think he's living in New Jersey or something like that. So, you know, oh, I think that's a come down. Well, I don't know. Maybe he's warmer. Anyway, um, Adams writes what I call landscape sculpture pieces. And there are a lot of composers who do that. I mean, they really are, really are lots of them. And, and they do it in lots of different ways. But one of the things that's characteristic of this music is its stillness, its slowness, its unvarying quality. It's an offshoot of minimalism in its way. Um, I, you know, he wrote a series of orchestral works called Becoming. One was called Becoming Ocean. One was called Becoming Desert. One was called Becoming, I, I, I don't know what it was, Becoming a Cabana, I, whatever, you know. I have them. They're in a little box. I, I'm not as thrilled with those pieces. I think Adams got a little bit uh, self-absorbed doing global warming political tracts in music, which, you know, it almost never works when there's a political tract underlying your music. But a lot of his music, In the White Silence and these other things, has been magnificent. Beautiful, beautiful, serene and... And, and contemplative works that require a great deal of concentration. A little bit also like Morton Feldman in that school, you know, extended pieces. But I, I find him to be tremendously gifted and enormously creative, and I've enjoyed hearing each new thing he's done. Haven't liked everything that he's done, but that's not the point, is it? The point is to find him interesting enough so that, yeah, you want to hear what he's got up his sleeve next. And John Luther Adams is another composer who is definitely worth, definitely worth watching. I, I, I think he's got a really original voice. The only other issue I have, by the way, with these sort of landscape things is that they're completely soulless. You know, and people say they're like Arvo Parrot, they're spiritual because they're very still and sometimes very long and very distended and, and alien. There's no humanity in them at all. There are no people. There's no human melody. There's no vocal melody. So there's no traditional emotional warmth or expression in them quite often. Not always. Again, you have to take each piece as it comes. But the concept is, 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 can be somewhat alienating for people who are used to more traditional musical expression. And I also think that um, it's very easy to simply be a completely static and uninteresting. You know, it's it's just a mobile, you know, it just sort of sits there. And if you get the shape, it's kind of nice. But the nice thing about a mobile or a, or a sculpture or an abstraction of some kind, or even a painting of a landscape, an empty landscape usually, is that you, you look at it for a minute and you go on. <laughs> but in these things, you listen to it for an hour and 20 minutes, and then it's like, ah. So that's, that's an issue with that style. And it's quite popular nowadays, and there are a lot of people doing it. So you have to really know how to pick them if you're interested in that stuff. You've got to have a lot of time. And I don't blame anyone who's not interested. But John Luther Adams, I think, is, is a fine, fine composer and well worth hearing. Next, let's see, we're already up to uh, 14. Not bad, huh? Roberto Sierra. Roberto Sierra, uh, I first heard when he made some recordings of his orchestral works that were on Koss Classics. Remember that label, the headphone people? They had blue, blue labels. He's Puerto Rican. And, you know, his music is recognizably Latin American in many respects. Um, he's written a great deal of orchestral music. He's sort of the the head musical guru of Puerto Rico, which means there are probably lots of lesser musical gurus who hate him because he's getting played and they aren't. I mean, such is the nature of the classical music industry. 
But Roberto Sierra has been around for a considerable amount of time. Yes, he has. I don't have his date here. Um, and, and he's written a lot of music that I've enjoyed very much. And he's another one who, if you get a chance to hear some of his pieces, just give him a listen and see what you think. Especially if you like that sort of Latin inflected music. I, he's a very, very good composer to, to sample. I think you'll find much to enjoy. And now, what are we on? 15. Okay. Jonathan Leshnoff. I talked about him just a couple days ago. Jonathan Leshnoff has really burst on the scene. He's got a lot of commissions. He's been recorded, you know, reference recordings with Manfred Hernick in Pittsburgh. Did his, you know, he did like a concerto thing for, what was it, clarinet and bassoon. It was coupled with that not very good Tchaikovsky fourth. And the Leshnoff piece was the good thing on the disc, which is really saying something. Leshnoff is a tonal composer who writes music of great lyricism and melodic beauty sometimes, which is really kind of nice for a change. Uh, he's written a bunch of symphonies. They've been recorded. This is his violin concerto on Naxos, along with his first string quartet, which is a four seasons, four movement cycle. So if you're looking for other, other aspects or interpretations of the four seasons, Leshnoff is a guy worth trying out. But the Violin Concerto is a beautiful work, too. Um, he's, he's pretty young. He was born in 73. Oh, God, I'm older than he is. You see, I'm not, I'm not the, uh, the, the, the oldest guy on the block, and I'm only talking about composers who are as close to death as makes no difference. He's a very serious voice, an up-and-coming voice, kind of like Jennifer Higdon. Um, you know, in that sense. I mean, he's, he has immediate audience appeal and the talent to write good tonal music that isn't pandering and that's full of evocative colors and textures and some really good tunes. So he's worth hearing. Finally, my last one. And it's, again, these are in no order. So it's no one's better, or finally, or whatever. Paul Schoenfield. Now, Paul Schoenfield did a fabulous disc of his orchestral music on Argo, which was just, just hilarious. I mean, he's, he's an eclectic. He's a major league eclectic. He writes, you know, klezmer music and with rock and, and, and jazz stuff. And he pulls from everywhere. He's one of those. He's a little bit like Bolcom, a little bit like Mahler, who he likes to quote now and again um, in his works. And, and that Argo disc is hilarious. and It's still around. So if you want to go have a look for it, it's Shone Field. You'll see his name down there. Um, and he's also got some discs of chamber music on, on Naxos and some other labels. So he's out there and you can hear him. And he reminds me a little bit, believe it or not, of Peter Schickley. Schickley in serious music vein, not as PDQ Bach, but his real music, which is actually very good. He's another composer who, who has the ability to effortlessly merge styles. You know, it's Poulenc, too, could do that as well. And Schoenfield is one of those guys. And, um, and he's just got a great sense of humor musically, and that's so rare. I mean, how often do we hear someone who really makes you want to like laugh out loud once in a while? It's not all slapstick, not, not a bit. But when he wants to go there, he, he goes there unerringly. So Paul Schoenfield is number 16. And that, my friends, is, I think, a pretty considerable list of contemporary composers. I hope you agree. And this is, like I said, less than five minutes, people I just wrote down off the top of my head without having to sweat. And if I wanted to sweat, I, I could have found a few dozen more. In fact, I was pulling these CDs out from my little shelfy thing there, and not even in the overflow room. I mean, talking right here in the regular collection. And I kept coming across other people who were not dead, who I think are terrific. So there are many, many, many more. And maybe I'll do a talk about some more of them at some point, but only after I know that all, however many subscribers I now have, you know, a substantial percentage of you have gone and listened to these people. You have to go and listen to them because now that I've told you who they are, you have no excuse. So thank you for joining me, friends. Get out there and go for it. Take care.